It's a, it's a great honour to be here. Um, this feels like a bit of a narcissistic ego trip, really, to, um, to be, asked to, talk, be, talk, be asked to talk about uh, a very long career, a 35-year career in the field, and the changes that I've seen in that field um, of working with what I'm now calling gender, sexualities, and relationship diversities. And that, that's our preferred term. I'm recording this bit at the same time as that. Um, that's our preferred term for talking about it because um, LGBT, I, Q, Q, A became quite an alphabet soup. And although you'd think everybody got included in all of that, actually it leaves out an awful lot of other people. So we started talking in a more general term of gender, sexualities and relationship diversities. Um, I consider myself incredibly fortunate. Reason for living, the things that you love, that which you're good at, that which the world needs, and that which you can be paid for. And it's, a, it's actually a, an incredible privilege to be able to do something that uh, drives me every morning to get up at, I don't know, five or six in the morning and work through for a kind of 12 hour day, often six days a week, sometimes seven. And I don't get tired, and I think that's partly because I'm doing something I love, and I think it's partly that I'm not working for anyone else but myself, and so um, I'm, I'm fairly motivated to do things. So I thought I'd share that diagram with you. So this t tonight's talk is a bit of a kind of snapshot of different episodes, different areas of my, of my life, and the things I've seen and the things I didn't think I would see. And the things, some of the things that I've become involved in. Um, and I thought it would be good to start at the beginning, really. Now, this is before I entered the field. This is, this is eight or nine years before I entered the field. And it's, the, it's a photograph of Dr. Henry Anonymous addressing the APA. And Henry Anonymous was John Fryer. He was a medical doctor, a, a psychiatrist, in fact, and a gay rights activist. And he became famous because he gave an anonymous speech to the 1972 American Psychiatric Association annual conference. And he had to do that in disguise for fear of discrimination and being thrown out of his job. I mean, the reason he was speaking to them is he was talking with great conviction about homosexuality not being a mental disorder. There he is, a psychiatrist, who could be diagnosed by everybody else in the room as having the mental disorder. And so it was a very important uh, presentation that, that he gave, and it was cited as a key factor in the decision to delist homosexuality as a mental illness in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Disorders, of Mental Disorders. Also in that picture are Barbara Gittings on the left, who was a lesbian activist and the founder of the Daughters of Bilitis, and Frank Kameni. Um, and Frank Kameni described the day in December the 15th, 1973, when the American Associate Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality. Um, he described it as the day we were cured en masse by the psychiatrists. <laughs> so that happened before I entered the field, as far as America was concerned. But when I entered the field in 1981, and this was one of the most other, the other most significant event of that year, was, <laughs> was a wedding. Um, and so nine years after the APA declassification, I began my training as a therapist. Um, and initially, I, I went and studied community and youth work because I wanted to be a youth counsellor. I'd already spent a couple of years working as a Samaritan and working as a residential social worker with traumatised young people. And I thought, this is, this is an area where I feel like I might be able to be accepted for being a gay man. Residential social work certainly wasn't that kind of an environment, especially if you're working with kids. Um, and despite the fact that the person who ran the uh, adolescent unit that I worked in for a year was a... Well, it was, it was rumoured that Miss Shaw was a lesbian. And she certainly had had a very close friendship with another unmarried woman who ran, where they ran a girls' uh, kind of remand home and boarding, um, 
Roman school for uh, about 18 years before she came to work with um, a mixed group of boys and girls. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't safe for her in the field, and it certainly wouldn't have been safe for me to come out to those young people. But within the Sams, within the Samaritans, I felt quite accepted. And I thought, therapy is probably one of those areas where you're either going to be accepted or they're going to tolerate you and not discriminate and be nasty to you for who you are. And whilst tolerance isn't um, something that I, uh, I want a great deal of in my life, people, therapists are generally too nice to kind of... I thought, in those days. <laughs> yes. Um, so, nine years after I enter the field, the World Health Organization catches up, um, and they declassify homosexuality as a disorder. This meme is, is two years old, so don't worry about the, the 24 years. It's 26 years now since it was declassified. Um, although, like the Americans, they still had in for the first the first period, the category of egodystonic homosexuality, meaning if you felt uncomfortable or ashamed or unhappy about your homosexuality, then you could still go and get treated for it. Um, I'm not sure how they were proposing to do that. Um, but the world, um, it, around the world, sexual orientation uh, is still heavily pathologized, if not criminalized. And so you'll, you'll be familiar probably with this map from ILGA. This was the latest map produced on, on International Day of uh, Homophobia, Bisphobia and Transphobia, Ida Hobbit. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of red and pink areas there, and there's a lot of areas of the world which don't have any classification, um, any specific rules, so they can kind of throw you into jail if they like, as in, as in the case of Russia. Um, so... It's, a, it's still a tough situation. I've just come back from a trip to Beijing where I was asked to go and do some work with the LGBT centre in Beijing. And um, they st you can still go into a Chinese hospital and get conversion therapy or reparative therapy um, and, uh, in, in their main hospitals. You have to pay for it uh, and uh, they're charging quite a lot of money and they're using the old school techniques that we were using back in the 60s of aversion therapy and electroshock therapy. Um, and it's against their own guidelines because homosexuality was declassified by the Chinese Psychiatric Association in 2000. So uh, 16 years later, the message hasn't quite got around. It's not just on an international stage that this, has, this is the case because... In the UK, there was a study done by Mike King, and some of you will have been familiar with this, in 2008, that found that 24% um, of... Was it 24%? 24%? The, 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 the attempts to... The secular therapists um, attempting to cure people who are... One in six, it's 17%. One in six, I think. Yeah. Um, so they, they, one in six members of the BACP, the UKCP, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the British Psychological Society would agree to enter into a contract to reduce same-sex attractions with a client that presented. Yeah? So whilst we think it's horrendous in other parts of the world, in our own, on our own doorstep it's also pretty bad. And I'll be talking a bit later about, about some efforts that... I and some others have been involved with in, in trying to stop that happening. So I thought I wanted to pay, I wanted to pay a, a tribute to the people who were my teachers. So on the, on the screen here, my very first supervisor who gave, and who gave me a training placement when I was straight out of, of college was Michael Jacobs. And some of you will know his name and others of you won't know who he is. He... Um, is he, he published many books, he wrote many books around the psychodynamic approaches to counselling. And he made psychoanalytic ideas accessible for the masses, for, for therapy masses. Um, and uh, he was working as a student counsellor at the University of Leicester at the time that I went in to do a placement with him. Um, and it was, he's, he's an extraordinary chap. And I was, I've, I've subsequently been asked to look at a, a book review 
for uh, the biography of his life. And it was really interesting reading some of the early chapters, how his early development is in the field mirrored my own. And he obviously had spotted that in me and thought, oh, he's a bit like me, really. So he gave me, he gave me a start in, in offering me a placement in the student health service at University of Leicester, where I would see three clients in, in a day. I would have an hour's supervision with him, and then I'd attend a case conference meeting with the doctors and him, and the, and the, psych, and the counsellors from Leicester Poly, as it was at the time. And so the, the, the group of us would have a kind of uh, a case discussion meeting at, at lunchtime. And so it was an, an amazing opportunity to learn and to have weekly supervision. And I learned so much from him. At the same time as doing that placement, I began another placement at the Leicester Counselling Centre. And Bernard Rattigan, um, who was an out gay psychoanalytic psychotherapist, um, was my supervisor and mentor for about five years. And Bernard was a particularly interesting man. He's the, he's the sharpest brain that I've met. Um, uh, a devout Roman Catholic, and I could never quite understand how he could reconcile his Roman Catholicism with being a political activist and an out gay man. But he managed, he managed to find a way through that. Um, and um, he, he was an incredible supervisor. So I... Uh, I felt it was, it was a great privilege to be mentored by someone who was very confident in his sexuality and could kind of see his way through the, the morass of the kind of pathologizing discourses that were still prevalent at the time and be very supportive of, of me and, and give me some very insightful um, uh, perspectives on, on the clients that I was working with. So that was kind of going on. And then I met Brian Thorne at a a weekend retreat for person-centred therapists um, that would happen annually at a place called Lawned Abbey in Leicestershire. And it's a lovely old abbey in the middle of the countryside, of the Leicestershire countryside. And he would go to this thing pretty every year. And I went to a, I went to a few. Um, and at one of those, um, I was talking about one... He, he was about to start at one of the first person-centred trainings in counselling and psychotherapy in Britain. And I was 21, 22 years old, something like this, probably. Certainly around that kind of age. And he, he said that he's starting this course and it's, he was all very excited about it. And he encouraged me to apply. And I was officially, more or less, unemployed. I was doing a voluntary placement with Michael. I was signing on. I was getting some volunteer work at the counselling centre. And I was just trying to make... Um, just trying to get some experience. And in those days, you could be on the dole and do voluntary work, and nobody kind of interfered with you, really. Um, and he said, well, uh, apply for the course, and if we take you, we've got a, burst, a trust alongside the programme, and we'll, um, we'll uh, come to an arrangement over your fees. So I got a grant from their trust. They gave me a place, and I got a grant, which paid a very substantial proportion of my fees, which... Was a, a, was a very important thing for me because I would not have managed to afford that, that training. And when we ran our own diploma training, um, we offered a similar scholarship to a trans therapist and, and paid for his fees, and it's kind of pay it forward, you know, re returning a favour. And that's, that seemed really important. So he, Dave Means and Elka Lambers, were setting up one of the first person-centred training programmes in Britain. And uh, I was lucky enough to get a place on it. And it was 12-hour days in a residential block, seven days a week, twice a year. So it's very long, very intense. They were feeling their way because it was the very first time they'd run the course. And it was a, a great learning opportunity. Um, so I wanted to kind of pay tribute to them. Soon in that process... Whilst I was in training, the HIV and AIDS epidemic hit. And um, I decided to leave Leicester uh, be, uh, because I'd got a job working for Mersey Regional Health Authority, um, spearheading a, an HIV and AIDS campaign. It was at a time when, in 1986 when people were very frightened around HIV and AIDS. There was no cure. There were no treatments. People were dying. Um, in large numbers, people were getting infected, and nurses were scared too. Um, it was, there were stories of you know, nurses passing the meals under the doors 
because they were frightened to get in close contact because nobody knew how this virus was being transmitted. And so um, I got this job with Mersey Regional Health Authority and um, it, was, it was the first appointment by a, by a health authority and I was covering the whole of the Merseyside region um, in, in HIV and AIDS. The, the, the very first appointment in the whole country prior to me was uh, a guy who got a job for Oxford City Council so I was like the second person paid to work in that field. And I got sent to, um, I got sent to America in 1987. So I spent Easter of 1987 in New York and in San Francisco, finding out about the HIV and AIDS treatment programs and uh, training and prevention and all, all kinds of things. I went on a, a kind of fact-finding mission. So I landed in New York, never having been to the States before, with three appointments in my diary, and I had three and a half days there. And by the time I flew out of New York, I'd had 19 appointments. So I was kind of ringing people up and running around and asking all kinds of questions about all kinds of areas. Because I didn't know what I would need to know and when I got back, but I thought I'd better research everything. So I was going off to um, Sloan Kettering and talking to AIDS pedi um, pediatricians. I was talking to psychiatrists. I was talking to the activists who were running the gay men's health crisis and picking up all that I could. And one of the things, one of the meetings that I had was with a, a psychotherapist, a gay male psychotherapist who was in private practice in Chelsea, in the gay neighborhood of Chelsea in, in Manhattan, called Michael Chernoff. And Michael and I re rekindled our connection many years later when he was writing a book around uh, called Without Condoms, and he was exploring the phenomena of barebacking. Um, and so he would then subsequently send me um, chapters for feedback and comment and stuff, and it was a really interesting um, project to be working with him on. So I, uh, the other thing, and the thing that I did in San Francisco was that I was there for, for two weeks, and I was to train with the Shanti Project um, and they, they provided what they were calling emotional support, and we called in this country buddies. Some of you will remember the buddy program that Terence Higgins Trust was doing. They, they had emotional support volunteers, and I trained with them as an emotional support volunteer and went through the whole two weekend, consecutive weekends of training, and then brought the training back, and I trained all of the buddies for Merseyside and for Manchester AIDS line. And they, they, so I trained the trainers, and then we delivered the training to, to um, the first sets of buddies. Uh, I'm really lucky in that I've done a lot of firsts in my career in terms of training. I love doing firsts. And it, it, um, so that was particularly exciting. And then I, I also developed training in HIV and AIDS counseling, um, using actors as playing patients, so that the staff got a really proper chance of you know, experiencing what it might be like to give uh, what might be a terminal diagnosis to somebody, um, which was a very tough thing for a health advisor or a psychologist to be doing. Um, that's not what they trained to do when they moved into sexual health. So um, we, we set up a course for that. I ran eroticizing safer sex workshops in a gay bar in, in Liverpool. Um, before it would open, we'd call people together on, and we got the con sometimes we'd get the consultant in GU Medicine down from the clinic and get him to do Q&A and take him out of the clinic. And he was an interesting man. He talked about the back passage. He said, you need to be very careful about things in the back passage. And of course, it's Liverpool, where a lot of back-to-back -back houses are. And I, and I thought, you really do need to be quite explicit in your language because it's not good enough just to talk about people's back passages when people are dying and they don't know how this is being transmitted. So uh, there's a point of learning there. Um, yeah, so I did a lot of training. AZT became available in about 1986, and it was the first and only drug available. It was caused anemia, it caused severe liver problems, um, but it was still, it's still used today to prevent mother-to-child mother transmission. But there wasn't any combination therapy treatments, and so lots of people were dying, lots of people um, were having a, a really tough time. And AIDS was so scary that we, 
didn't want to give people, people couldn't do um, tests and get their results over the phone or anything like that. You couldn't get your results through the post. You had to go in, um, usually wait two weeks before you got your, uh, your results. So that was a very tough period for people to be waiting. And then, um, and then you'd go back to the clinic and they, the, the health advisor or the, uh, the, the HIV counsellor would tell you. One of the developments that's happened more recently is that you can now get an HIV self-test. You can order a kit online, you can take your own sample, and you can do the same rapid test that they'll do at Dean Street in your own living room and, and deal with the results yourself nowadays. You don't need to go through pre- and post-test counselling. So that's a development in the field. And I think that's, that's, um, that's because... We've got antiretroviral therapies now, and of course, if somebody is HIV positive and stable on their medication for at least six months, they'll soon develop an undetectable viral load, which means they're not infectious anymore. And that's made a very big difference to the quality of people's lives. It's, so we're now encouraging people to get lots of testing so that they know when they, if they're infected and they can go on to treatment and become undetectable. It's hugely significant. Another hugely significant thing is that we've got PrEP now. PrEP is one of those antiretroviral pills, uh, Truvada is the one that's generally used, which if you take it on a regular basis, it will protect you against getting HIV. So one of the things that I never thought I'd see when I entered the field was a tablet that you could take that would prevent you getting HIV. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable that we've, that we've got that. And as some of you will know, the government have been equivocating over whether they were going to pay for this on the NHS or not. There's a lot of slut shaming going on for gay men who are choosing to take PrEP. Um, but in, in San Francisco, where I snapped that last picture, they've got pictures all over the metro and the tubes telling people to, to go onto it, and it's, you can get it on your health insurance. And it is expensive, it's £400 a month. So if the NHS were to pay without negotiating a deal with the manufacturers, then it would be expensive. But it's much more expensive to treat someone for the lifetime of their illness if they, if they um, got sick. You can buy it online for about £50 a month, the equivalent of £50 a month, and get it shipped in. So it becomes affordable for most of us that are working that would want to go on it um, irrespective of whether the the government are going to give it to us on the NHS. But, so it was a very bleak picture when I started working in HIV. Um, it's a less bleak picture now, for sure. But I think some of the issues that are facing gay men with HIV are that they're now, they've now been on treatment and they're not dying. Many of them went on to treatment at the time when they thought they were going to be dying. And they may have been long-term sick and claiming sickness benefits, disability benefits. They may have got a freedom pass or a mobility car and been paid at a, at a com relatively comfortable level of benefit to survive on. And they might have been on that for 30 years and not working. And, and now the benefits review system is causing everybody to be reviewed and to be kicked off benefits if they don't need to be on it. And, and in a way, that's a sensible thing, but you, you're kicking people off who haven't actually had a work history, who might be now in their 40s or 50s or 60s, and who might have only been working as a, as a shop person or working in a very unskilled way before, and they've been out of work for all this time. So there's a, there's a difficulty in what do we do and how do we integrate people back into society um, and um, there's, there's, there's also an issue, or in a sense an existential issue, about I think many of these people have lost the meaning and purpose in their lives mm -hmm. as because they've not been involved in, they haven't found their icky gay. Um, and uh, so it's one of the things that I think that's happened is we've got a huge chemsex epidemic, and I'll come back to that in a, in, in a bit later. So my next... My next little episode or snapshot is back to 1987. And this is um, Margaret Thatcher addressing the Conservative Party conference. It's only a minute.
Which one is the Which one is the Which one is the Two of them. Our children don't get the education, education they need. need. The education, the education they deserve. deserve. Children who are not being taught to express traditional normal values are being taught that they have an alienable, alienable right, right to be gay. To be gay. All of those children are being are cheated, cheated of a sound, of a sound start, start in life. life. Yes, yes, cheated. cheated. Okay. Um, it's quite chilling when I see Margaret Thatcher giving that speech. I get kind of goosebumps. Um, so section 28 of the 1988 Local Government Act forbade <coughs> local, gov local councils from doing anything that might encourage homosexuality in any way. Um, and uh, it was never really challenged in the court, but it did a profound job at policing and censoring uh, developments in, uh, in service provision, um, and it, was a, it became quite a, a tough period. What schools would teach, what books you could get from the library, um, what services that the council would fund in terms of community uh, support organisations and the like. So I thought it was worth um, a, a nod back to um, that era as I kind of reviewed the 35 years. Um, some of you will know that I um, edited with Charles Neal three textbooks, the, uh, the Pink Therapy Trilogy. Often people know about, they can't say, oh, I've read your book. And I think, well, which one? But they generally mean the first Pink Therapy. Um, so the first one came out in 1996, and there hadn't been anything else in Britain. And what I was trying to do was take the, the research and the ideas that I was finding in journal articles and textbooks published in the States and see which ideas I thought would translate to our culture here. Because not a lot of things, not everything will translate to, to how things are here. And then, and then share those ideas and, and put some stuff together. So the first book came out, it, it was very well received. I think people were hungry for something, given there hadn't been anything before. And then we did a book on different theoretical perspectives so the psychoanalytic and the Jungian and the CBT and the person-centred and, and all of these different... So we've got chapters written about those, about what does the model say about homosexuality and sexual diversity? Uh, what, so does it have a history that's, that's quite a negative history? CBT doesn't. Psychoanalysis did, um, for example, just to, to, to give a couple of ideas. Um, and then what do you do to try to make your model more useful for LGBT people? Um, you know, how might you adapt the theory to be more applicable or helpful? Um, and so that was, that was the kind of premise behind that book. And then Issues in Therapy, the third book, which both the, the second and third came out in the same year, uh, is looking at certain you know, subpopulations or social contexts. Um, that I think a lot of, some of the information is still useful, a lot of it's out of date. A lot of the thinking around, um, around these identities is, is quite different now. And so I'm, I'm not recommending people um, go out and get them and use them anymore. Instead, I recommend the book that Meg John Barker and Christina Richards um, have, have written on gender and sexual diversities and mental health perspective. For mental health, For mental health, For mental health professionals. Uh, I, I, it's a really accessible book. It's, it's not an expensive book. These are 30 quid each. It's not, an it's not an expensive book, and it's a really... It should be on everybody's reading list if they're working with gender and sexual diversities. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> I, I mean, what's right with it is a really cute chest. What's wrong with it? Mm -hmm. Is that thing about, you know, the hero of time that you turn in this or turn in that, and, you know, specifically that if you're, you know, bisexual, there's a whole range right, right, yes. Um, and it's missing on that, and there is no turn in it. 
Okay, so the idea is you can flick a switch and suddenly you will turn gay or you'll turn, you'll turn not gay or you'll turn heterosexual. That's one of the things that's wrong with it. It's kind of implying um, that there's, there's an essentialist narrative there, that you're born this way um, and you could, or you could flick a switch, eugenics might be able to come along and, and find, we'll find the gay gene and we'll turn it off and there'll be no more gay people. And this is, I mean, it's interesting because there is still quite a lot of biological research being conducted, sometimes by gay scientists, looking into what causes homosexuality. And they've got some interesting uh, theories. The, the theories for what causes homosexuality in men are different to what causes homosexuality in lesbians. They don't really have a theory. When they put these theories out there, I think, OK, so how does that theory apply to bisexuality? Mm -hmm. Because the bisexual test is a good one, because they're, they're, they're playing with the idea that there's a binary, and there isn't a binary of our sexuality, um, and there isn't a single cause. So it might be an interplay between some biology and between the social environment. Um, but uh, sexuality is a fairly plastic thing for many of us. It cha can change depending on the situation we're in and where we are. And, um, <laughs> Situational homosexuality, for example, single-sex institutions like prisons and boarding schools and those kinds of things. People who might be very solidly heterosexual outside, they go into a single-sex prison for an extended period and their heterosexuality becomes a little bit more plastic. At least in terms of behaviour. Their identity might still remain, I am heterosexual. We are just doing this because... We're a couple of blokes helping each other out, or, or whatever rash, rationalizations they might be having. Um, and uh, Orange is the New Fruit is, a, is another example of that happening in, in women's prisons. Um, but so, I think when I started out, I, would, I was thinking much more in essentialist ideas, and I think over the years I've come to realize that those ideas of born this way are not really very helpful. Um, and certainly they don't seem to reflect current thinking. So one of the things that I and, and some others in this room have been involved with is this document, which was signed in and released in January 2015. Um, and you can download it from the UKCP website as a PDF. It's the Memorandum of Understanding on Conversion Therapy, or MOU1. Um, and it looked at gay, particularly at conversion therapy against lesbians and gay men. Um, because not only are there, is it happening within the religious communities or some, some religious communities, but it's, it's also happening amongst private practitioners um, and within the NHS. Uh, not officially, but if you go in tears to a therapist and say that you're gay and you really don't want to be and could they possibly help you. A lot of people, because they've had very little training in how to work with that issue when they're presented with that dilemma, and because they're good people who want to help people, they often agree to a contract to reduce or eliminate same-sex attractions, even though they have no model or methodology or evidence-based treatment that they can offer, but they bimble around trying to support someone and not really do, um, achieve, achieve their goals. So this document was written to, uh, to try to say that that was uh, not ethical and that we got a way forward for dealing with that. But we didn't feel that it was, um, it was good enough and we wanted to continue to meet to monitor how it was being implemented. So it was signed by, and I don't know if you can see the logos clearly enough, but it was signed by NHS England, all the leading science therapy bodies, BABCP, BACP, UKCP, BPS, Royal College of Psychiatrists, Relate, the Gay Doctors, and the Association of Christian Counselors were on board. And I went into the meetings feeling quite wary about them. And actually, they've been the strongest allies and the people who are most on the case and understand the issues. It's some of the more, it's the other major bodies that I think um, there have been some problems with. But we realised that this document wasn't um, expansive enough. And uh, in particular, we were concerned that 
asexuals and people um, and on the gender spectrum were being um, were not covered by it and needed to be covered by it. Um, so gender change efforts or gender conversion therapy is a, certainly a thing um, where especially vulnerable and gender vulnerable gender diverse young people and it happens with adults as well but but particularly young people who express a great conviction that they're not comfortable in the gender that they were assigned at birth, the parents don't know what to do or they're concerned and they take them to a therapist, um, whether to a CAM service or whether to a private therapist or the doctor. Um, and sometimes what happens, because people have had very little training and understanding and knowing what to do about this, what they, and they have, they've, not been, they've not been following the current research or anything, they may well advise the parents to actively discourage any cross-gender play or presentation uh, and just encourage them to remain in the assigned sex and kind of knock it out of them. It's just a phase. They'll grow out. Don't, don't encourage it. Now, that's not helpful. Um, and so we wanted to ensure that um, vulnerable uh, kids and adults were included in this. The other area around asexuality, people who are asexual may well have been sent for sex therapy because uh, their partner was unhappy that they weren't having, didn't want to have sex, uh, and they may well have been diagnosed with something called hypersexual desire disorder or inhibited desire disorder. Um, and their partner's kind of wanting them fixed, you know, make them sexual, make them want to have sex. And they may feel very guilty and bad about that, and they may go along with the treatment, or, or, but, but actually, if they're asexual, that treatment is not right or going to be helpful. And so we wanted to be able to include this, this group within the, 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 um, within the document. And there's a bit of a hoo-ha about this, because um, some of the leading bodies, BACP in particular, um, said that they, um, they, but they weren't sure that they would be able to go, along and go ahead and sign this document. Um, they would need to refer the decision to their board which is all well and good, but I got a call from the deputy, direct, the, um, the deputy chief executive warning me that it's likely that they may not sign it when it goes to the board, and I, because they said that there was insufficient evidence or research in this area, on both of those areas, so they didn't, they didn't think that the board would be up for signing it. Now, many of the other organisations did accept and would sign, but they said they needed to talk about this and, and think about it. And I got... Uh, fairly disappointed, <laughs> to say it, the, it, it mildly, about that. Um, and uh, I wrote a blog, which became a bit of a viral blog, about, it was my, rec my um, accreditation with BACP. I'm a senior accredited practitioner with BACP. And, and uh, some time back, they also gave me a fellowship for my significant contribution to the field. So that's the highest accolade they give to anybody. It's like a knighthood in, in counselling, you know. Um, so I'd already got, I got that, and then they, and, but they've done F all, really, for LGBT plus people over the years. And so I thought, and now I felt completely betrayed. Um, and so I thought, I'm going to mobilise some resources strategically. So I made this announcement that I, I was very disappointed and I'm going to probably be resigning. And their board met. And, and what happened was lots of people saw this, organised, you know, some people organised a petition, other people sent in their unpublished dissertations in working with asexuals and working with transgender people. And BACP board got a lot of research and they got a lot of information. And then on the day that they came to discuss it, they made the right decision and said, okay, we accept that there, are, there is evidence. They just didn't know about it. And that's one of the ways in which, you know, people's lived experience is not counted as research. If, it's not, if there hasn't been a gold standard study done, then actually it doesn't exist. And I don't think that's right. You know, I'm, I'm an activist as well as a therapist, and we're active in, you know, things like Facebook. We've got pink therapy groups for therapists, and... And there's a lot of discussion goes on there, and a lot of trans people are also participating in the discussions on Facebook about their experience of engaging with mental health professionals, and they've got some pretty horrendous stories to tell. And so it's really important that we get our game together. Um, and what we wanted was 
some core competencies around equality and diversity uh, to ensure that all therapists receive basic sexuality awareness training. Most therapists don't even know about sexuality generally, let alone all of the more interesting groups that I'm working with. Um, and, uh, and to ensure that gender and sexual diversity issues are woven through the training to be a therapist and not just a kind of tokenistic add-on where often they get the student who is from one of those minority groups to become the expert and teach the class. Um, and, and if they do that, they, you know, they're teaching the class about their experience. Not, they're not a trainer and they don't necessarily know much beyond their own sphere. Um, so it's, it's hugely inadequate. Um, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm up for them funding some research into this area. I think more research does need to be done. Um, but I think that um, we've also got a fair amount of knowledge around, out there. Um, in MOU1, these are the, um, these are the two, co two parts that I think I, I, I feel most pleased are in the document as somebody involved in training. So it says those with a responsibility for training will work to ensure that trainings prepare therapists to sufficient levels of cultural competence that they can work effectively with LGB clients. So remember this is MOU 1. I'm not allowed to show you the, the, the statements for MOU 2 and I'm not allowed to talk beyond about what's happened since BACP said that they would sign up because I'm now bound by, we've agreed, we should all be confidential in the meetings. We didn't, hadn't agreed that. So we've now got an agreement, so I can't tell you what's been happening lately. But also training organizations will refer to the BPS guidelines on working with gender and sexual minority clients. Um, and that you may or may not know about this, but the BPS have got a very good and very comprehensive series of guidelines around <coughs> LGBTQ plus um, and it's, you can download it or you can email me and I'll send a copy to you. I've learned a lot over the years and this is the most rapidly growing field that any of us could be working in. Um, and one of the hugest explosions is, is how we, what we know and how, what we think about and how we express gender. In the past decade, masses has, has happened in this. Um, and so this is an example of the transgender umbrella. Uh, and I'm really, I'm really struck by how it, it's, it's influenced my thinking and the thinking of, of, of many of my colleagues. But a couple of years ago, I went to Sao Paulo to, um, to do some teaching. And I was teaching a, a, a class of about uh, 15 uh, therapists. And everybody was going around and saying their name and what they do and, you know, how it is at the beginning of a training. And there was a professor of sexology there um, who had been working in the field for 30 years. Um, and he gave me his book, uh, The Eleven Genders, that he wrote around the same time that Pink Therapy came out in the mid-90s. So I thought, you know, what am I going to say? Everybody, there was, you know, there's this... Neuro neuropsychiatrist, there was a woman who ran the major NGO for young trans people, she was a psychoanalyst, that it was the most experienced group that I'd ever sat in front of, to, and I thought I was going to be teaching them, and uh, I, think I was getting smaller and smaller and smaller as we went round, and I realised the level of expertise in the room, but we managed to spend a useful two days together. They, they knew a lot about their own little areas, well, their own significant areas, um, uh, but it was, their area was quite narrow in focus and there were all sorts of other identities and experiences that they, they weren't aware of so we could talk about those and make it more rounded. Um, the, the toilet debate, and there was a little image that just came up there about the toilet sign and, and the toilet sign is not about privacy uh, or abuse, it's about dignity. And it's really important that we give people dignity when they want to go to the toilet. And it's just, a, it, it really annoys me that it gets hijacked by, by certain populations saying, oh, it's, it's terrifying, paedophiles are going to be going into toilets. It's absolutely ridiculous that that's going to happen. This is another way in which gender can, can be thought of, the gingerbread person. Um, and uh, you can follow that up online if you want to get more of it. This is, 
this is a sexuality spectrum, or, and it, it, it came because I wanted to look for something around asexuality, the spectrum of asexuality. And I've learned a lot about asexuality in the last uh, uh, probably eight or nine years that I didn't know before, and I found it quite hard to understand asexuals to start with because I'm a very sexual being, and it was, so it was the biggest learning curve for me to think, so you don't actually have a sex drive? Wow, how do you cope? How do you organize your life? And, and actually, I've learned an awful lot about, a, about sex, love, romance, connection from colleagues and peers who are asexual because there's so much to be taught from a different perspective. And there's so many different areas in the way in which dif different shades, if you like, of, of asexuality in the spectrum. So if you don't know much about it, it's an area that's worth going and looking at. Um, when I started out, I talked about sexual minority therapy because Gay Affirmative got a lot of criticism as a title when I put the first book out. There were various um, leading lights who took, took apart the term gay affirmative therapy, some of them for quite good reasons. Um, and so I stopped using it um, and I started talking about sexual minority therapy. And then the whole transgender explosion was happening. I thought, well, actually, sexuality is different to gender, so we need to put gender in there too. And we're gendered. Oh. We're gendered before we're, um, uh, uh, before we're sexual. So I put gender at the front, so it became gender and sexual minority therapy. Then it became sexual, gender and sexual diversity therapy, because if you look at the prevalence figures of all of these different groups that make up uh, the population, there are the, the swans, as I call them, who are people who are married, heterosexual, and stay monogamous for life, because swans do that. Um, they don't get married, but, <laughs> but, but they mate for life. Um, they, they are in the minority when we look at everything else. Um, and so uh, gender, sexual diversity seems more important than minority. And then we added the word relationships uh, into this as well, to include people in lots of different relationship constellations. And a few years back, we started running the very first course in relationship counselling for GSRD people. Because if you're a poly, in a poly constellation, you're polyamorous, if you were to go to relate, for example, they would probably say they couldn't work with you because... Well, they've only got two chairs in the room for the, for the clients. And they've been trained to work with a couple. They've been trained to work with a couple and they've been, they get money from the government in order to keep families together. And the idea that you're polyamorous, well, that just throws the whole heteronormative um, paradigm out the window. If you're in, a, relation, if you're in a, a BDSM relationship where there are ne clearly negotiated consensual hierarchies, um, and you want to go for therapy because your relationship's got into distress, and you went to a couple counselling organisation, like Relate, um, I'm not just going to attack Relate all evening, but you know, like Relate, for example, then um, you'd be told, well, we can't work with you because you're engaging in intimate partner violence, or, or, and, and, and you're beating a partner, that's not acceptable, we can't work with you. We don't work with people who do domestic abuse. Um, so we started, uh, and, um, and the dynamics for same-sex couples, for, the dynamics between a lesbian couple is different to the dynamics between a gay male couple, and they're both different to the dynamics that generally exist between heterosexual couples. Um, some common things occur, and quite a lot of differences. So we started a course on, on working with relationships. So things... Some of the things I did not expect to see 35 years ago. I didn't expect to see people walking down the streets expressing public displays of affection. I mean, that blows me away every time I see it. I'm still moved when I see that happen. And, I'm I, you know, I'm, and I make a, try to make a conscious effort to do it myself. Uh, because I think the visibility of this makes a difference to how we think about lesbian and gay relationships, seeing that visibility. Um, and we have this idea that being out is generally better for our well-being. It's not better for everybody's well-being, who who's, comes from a, a um, 
particularly cultural minority groups, if you're, if you're gay, it's not necessarily better for your mental health to be coming out. Um, but in general, I mean, I think it's better for my mental health for me to be out. Um, and if I uh, hold my partner's hand, pretty much, and you know, I live in the West End, so I'm, I'm very privileged to kind of live in a safe space where there's a high, pre you know, nobody cares, nobody bats an eyelid deliberately, explicitly, most of the time. But um, you still get these microaggressions. Uh, microaggressions is a term co coined by Daryl Sue, uh, which are the kind of little look downs, the sneers, the look away, the pretending they haven't seen you. The, those kinds of things still happen all the time. They don't just happen from uh, heterosexual people. They happen from my own community as well. You're giving the game away, you're letting the side down, what are you doing being so flamboyant? I'm trying to pretend that I'm, nobody can tell who I am. You know, it's, so, and those microaggressions take a toll on our mental health. So it's hard being visibly out all the time. It's a strain. Um, and there are times when I don't feel up to that. And, you know, I'm not going to be flag-waving my hand-holding. Um, other things I didn't expect to see, I've talked about Truvada. I mean, I didn't expect that we could, by this time, we would have a pill we could take to protect us against HIV. And I think that's quite phenomenal. And I think it will make a huge difference, because if it were funded, we could be eradicating HIV um, in a generation. And that would be marvellous. And they're working on vaccines and all sorts, but it's just incredible. Other things I didn't think I'd see? I didn't think I'd see lesbians and gay men, bisexual people openly parenting kids in same-sex relationships. I didn't think I'd see that. You know, when I, when I started working as a therapist, um, I would often talk with clients about, you know, what do you think, you know, what's good for you about being gay? And what do you think are the challenges for you about being gay? What's the less good bits? As a way of trying to get into the kind of shadow side or the internalized shame or whatever. And one of the things that was often said was, well, it's, it's a pity I'm not going to be able to have children. That's one of the bad things about being gay. I'm not going to be able to have children. Well, I'd like that. And I'd go, yeah, I can understand that. It's a real shame that, that's, that, that we can't do that. And that was rubbish. You know, actually, that was rubbish from my own perspective. Lots of people were married and having had kids and then came out later, so they had kids. Um, there were lots of ways in which people were having kids. You know, they were coming to an arrangement with a lesbian friend or a woman would carry, I mean, carry a, a friend might be carrying a baby for them. But it was much more quieter then. Now surrogacy is more um, visible and available. And now same-sex parents can go for artificial insemination treatments. It, lesbians, gay men can't get inseminated yet. But they're probably working on that. But I think that's a significant difference. Um, I don't know if many of you saw this movie, Vi the Vice documentary on chemsex. It's really, taken, it's really taken a big hold in my practice. About three quarters of the people I see are involved in, uh, in taking a certain combination, a combination of three or four drugs uh, in a deliberate way to facilitate them having sex. So they, chemsex is the term for people who might be using methadrone, crystal methamphetamine, GHB or GBL, and sometimes ketamine, um, in combination in order to facilitate sex. And instead of just getting, having sex after being high on pills like ecstasy, They'll, they'll set out, they'll go online at the beginning of the weekend, not go out clubbing and end with some sex. They'll, they'll go online and have sex parties or chill outs. And it's, it can be hugely problematic. Um, so what we're seeing is, you know, it's, it's, it's become facilitated by apps like Grindr um, because that's really changed the way in which gay and bisexual men meet, have sex and do relationships. And we're still trying to understand the impact on dating and, and sexuality as it affects, as it affects um, us. But it is having a big impact, and, and certainly it makes, a very, it makes it very easy to find people. Because you're anonymous online, you can just say what you like and, and things. And, and so people 
may well be advertising for chill outs or for extra people to come around as group to, to join in with the group sex. But they'll also be maybe advertising that they're selling drugs and that they could just pop around and deliver you some. Um, so it makes it very easy. And we're seeing a rise in, in injecting drugs. You know, gay men never used to inject their drugs. We took pills and took our shirts off and danced. Um, and now we're injecting, and that used to be a you know, hard limit, and it still is a hard limit for, for many people. Um, and we're seeing um, rapes and deaths occurring because of people passing out or overdosing on GHB or, or GBL. It's a liquid that you only need a tiny amount of, and the difference between being high and feeling very sexy and passing out or going into a coma are points of a milliliter. And so if your eyesight's a bit wonky and your hands are shaking a bit, trying to measure out the right dose is um, problematic. And, um, and we're seeing people waking up from having been passed out, wondering what happened to them whilst they had been passed out. And then can they really go and talk about that to the police? Because, well, did they consent? I mean, maybe they were consenting. How do you determine consent? You can't actually consent to something when you're intoxicated. but. It's very complex, and Gallup, the, the gay and lesbian policing project, um, have, a have a worker who specialises in working with people around um, sexual assaults, and, and she's seeing a lot, of, a lot of people. And you might wonder, well, why is all this going on, really? What's it all about? Why do people want to do that? And I think one of the things that people are wanting to do, I think the gay men are craving intimacy, closeness, friendship um, and this is a way in which they're seeking to get those intimacy needs met um, and there's a fear I think perhaps of connecting unless they get disinhibited by drugs and on my I recently came back after Beijing I went off to California I think I'm an international globe trotter but I came back I, while I was in California I saw somebody called Doug Braun Harvey, who we're bringing to Britain to speak at our, to run a one-day workshop on treating out-of-control sexual behaviour at our conference next year. Um, and uh, he did some work about 10 or 15 years before around um, what he was calling sex, drug, stroke, drug-linked behaviour. Um, and he found in his, in his treatment programme in a group addiction uh, treatment, was um, the people entering recovery with the highest levels of shame who managed to talk about, he brought a sexual health perspective to the treatment program, which wasn't, isn't what happens in most drug treatment programs. They don't, they don't talk about sex in any way. He found that if you treat the shame, then um, people stay in recovery afterwards and they understand what the, was driving this and they're able to get their intimacy needs met without needing to get high to do so. So that was cool. Um, I did a sponsored silence for gendered intelligence last year and raised 600 quid. I've learned a lot about being silent in that 24 hours. It was quite hard. 24 hours. Um, I learned how frightening it was not to be able to speak and to tell your truth. Um, how frustrating it can be when you're trying to get through the busy streets of London and you can't say excuse me. Um, how assertive, how hard it is to assert yourself and complain about things when you feel really disempowered in your life. It was a really interesting, you know, how lonely it is to feel when your only safe space is your bedroom or your living room, online, talking with people. And I got a lot of support online from, from my friends and colleagues who was, you know, accompanying me in this sponsored silence. So I didn't speak for 24 hours, but I was busy online. And I felt really isolated without that. So I learned, I learned a number of things. Um, I'm going to rattle on because I want to stop and give you some Q&A. Uh, I, earlier this year, I got invited by um, our former Prime Minister um, to attend his LGBT garden party. Um, he, throw, he, he, throws this, he threw this e each year uh, to invite the kind of key movers and shakers in the gay community um, so that they can applaud how well he's done at policy and, and, and things. And he did quite a lot of good things in his time. I don't think we'll be seeing any of that from that his replacement, um, but I, I couldn't in any conscience take that kind invitation given what, what his government were also doing, 
You know, I, I'd met, just before I got this invitation, I met Jane Ellison MP, who was the Deputy Health Minister, uh, to talk about the MOU and went to update her on the MOU um, and the progress that we've been making in the committee. Um, and then I kind of looked into her background a bit and learned that she sort of voted to support the benefit cuts. Um, she'd voted against allowing 3,000 unaccompanied refugee children into the UK. She was uh, responsible within the health ministry. Uh, her boss was saying that the junior doctors were to write to work unsafe contracts. And I thought, actually, we're all in it together here, and I don't think I want to go and pat David on the back or feel very awkward at his garden party um, when the government aren't doing, aren't looking after the more vul most vulnerable of people. So um, I declined. Um, I'm going to pass over that. Uh, I, I got various notices and awards over the thing. I'm just rattled through that. It's boring. We've had, we've had um, a number of conferences, and I hope that you might come to our next one. So the URL is up there. It's on gay men this time. Uh, last year we, we worked around the theme of bisexuality, although it was quite, we mustn't call it bisexuality because that puts people off. So we called it beyond gay and straight because there's a lot in the, who, of people who don't define as gay or straight but wouldn't feel comfortable um, identifying as bisexual. And it was a really good conference. And, and these conferences are on our YouTube channel. So Pink Therapy UK YouTube channel you'll be able to view the presentations that have happened. Um, and so, yeah, so come to the conference. And I'll leave that as the closing slide, and we'll take Q&A. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>